So Lisa, how nice to see you. And um, it's we're all trying to remember what it was like going abroad, coming back. You've just come back. I've just come back. How did you find it? Well, it was wonderful to see my daughter. That was the main reason for going um, to Canada in this case. And um, I couldn't go to the United States. So it was terrific. And I have, you know, longed for travel during the entire period of lockdown. And um, despite the difficulties, despite the forms to fill, despite everything, um, and I'm not a very intrepid traveler, I was so pleased to have done it. <laughs> And you? Yes, well, I found it a nightmare, all those forms, but um, I was pleased. I nearly cried when I got to Italy and felt this is the heart of the Europe that we've been severed from, but still. Um, because we're, we're working today with the idea of memory. And I was trying to remember when we first met, and I think it was through psychoanalysis and writing, wasn't it? I mean, my dad was an analyst, and you had connections to all sorts of analysis. Well, do you know, I have a very porous memory, um, strange, strange for a person who writes about the subject so much, or maybe that's why. But I remember the scene of meeting you and in your parents' house. Um, I think it was a party that your mother and father had had, and I don't know why I was there. Perhaps it was to do with uh, the fact that we published some writers that he was interested in it while we were doing Writers and Readers. And um, anyhow, there you were. And I remember this extraordinarily vibrant and beautiful young poet who had just landed from Greece. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's completely different from my memory. My memory is of a sunny Cotswold garden. And you hear this, this glamorous and beautiful girl who was, knew all about psychoanalysis lying on the grass somewhere. So that was also under some umbrella of psychoanalysis. Well, there you are. I remember nothing of that. <laughs> there we go. That is the nature of memory, I'm afraid. A lot of it is to do with forgetting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's so interesting because... Um, you know, this book that I've I've just written, it took me 10 years and it's landed me completely in your territory. And I didn't know that was going to happen. I mean, you've written about it brilliantly with the role of memory and repression and forgetting. I mean, it, the memory man, which was in, I think, 2005, and then losing the past, your memoir. And what happened to your parents in a way was so similar to what happened to my heroine in Crete. But I, I, I mean, it was it's just sort of, creepy how extraordinarily close it is. Well, I think there are a lot of um, Second World War time stories that, that uh, reverberate with some of this material because of course, the people who got through the war, I mean, whether they were, you know, Jews or, or not, I mean, you know, other people too got through in, uh, terrible experiences. Um, I think a lot of them in the initial period did not want to remember. I mean, they were forced to remember in the way that memories occur, but as soon as they could shed some of those memories, um, I think they had to concentrate on the present and the future, particularly if they had small children to look after. So what, what um, you know, as children, we think of as our parents' secrets and buried memories are sometimes just, the fact of the way that people lead their lives as they go through time. Um, but children pick up all the cues and, and really losing the dead. Uh, my family memoir was about that. That's the, my parents' war and it's sequelae, it's, it's uh, reverberations through my, my brother's childhood. Would you like to read a bit of that? I, well, I can if you like. I mean, it, it's, um, and then, then we can compare and contrast, if you like. Yeah, sure. Um, because I loved what you did in, in Daughters of the Labyrinth. Um, so um, I wrote this book at, at the turn of the millennium, and I wrote it in part because my children had started asking about their very, very odd grandparents <laughs> or what they thought were people who didn't quite fit into their English upbringing. And um, so... I started to do both research, which was historical, as well as the kind of memory work that one does with people who are older and try, try to find out through what they remember what actually happened. And it was just the time when my mother was beginning to lose her memory. I mean, she was getting what they called Alzheimer's then. Um, and so the book is about that. Anyhow, this is the very opening. In my father's last days, he transformed the ordinary London hospital ward where he lay into an, an SS camp. 
The white-coated doctors became black uniformed officers, their boots hammering over floorboards with deadly intent as they approached his cell. Medical implements were instruments of torture, the oxygen mask a purveyor of poison gas. My momentarily absent mother was a whore servicing the ranks, whether willingly or not was a moot point. In any case, she was not altogether to be trusted. Only I was, and I would help him to get out of here. His hand gripped my wrist, his eyes, two glistening points of feverish pleading in an ashen face, gazed at me in desperation. He seemed to know me, though I didn't know who that me was meant to be. A sister not yet lost, perhaps. He spoke in a language he hadn't used to address me in for over 30 years. And he spoke with a flat, grim certainty, his voice a hoarse whisper emerging from some depth of pain and history. Occasionally, he would raise his head from the pillow and with a tense alertness echoed in the bite of his fingers, would check to see whether one of them was listening. My rational protests were shushed into stillness. A day earlier, he had tried to make his escape, a pajama clad figure breaking out from the confines of University College Hospital into the freedom of the streets. He had been brought back by an informer, he said, in cahoots with my mother. But that night, with my help, his escape would be certain. It was that night he died. The content of my father's diabetic delirium shook me. He hadn't talked of the war years since my childhood. Yet at the end, they were there, intact, like some willfully obscured and venomous secret, which all his later experience couldn't obliterate. A slight shift of the kaleidoscope of consciousness, and those distant years surfaced, still charged with enough raw emotion to prepare his hallucinatory fantasies. Terror for him always came in uniform. Memory is an emotional climate, a thick set of sights and smells and sounds and imprinted attitudes which can pollute as well as clarify. In several parts of the world today, battles of ideas are fought over how we remember whether it's slavery or the Second World War or indeed empire. <laughs> um, all those things are part of it. So I, I just want to read one more paragraph because I think it will frame what we talk about later. So this book is a journey into my parents' past, into that foreign country they carried within themselves, which was also the country of war. The psychological tropes, the ways of confronting and filtering experience, which structured their lives, grew largely out of that war and subsequent immigration. I suspect they passed these patterns onto my brother and me as surely as they passed on their genes and with as little choosing. Understanding this transgenerational haunting is part of the journey. And perhaps in a century where migration forced or chosen is the norm, is it is its most common part. Memory, like history, is uncontrollable. It manifests itself in unruly ways. It cascades through the generations in a series of misplaced fears, mysterious wounds, old habits. The child inhabits the texture of these fears and habits without knowing they are memory. Wow, yeah. I mean, I. I should have reread your, maybe if I'd reread your memoir before I did the last phase of this book, I wouldn't have dared finish it in a way. But I was yeah. coming. Don't, from... don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's so powerful um, and painful. I was, I mean, I came onto this material in Crete so differently because um, I'd lived in Crete on and off for 40 years. I was first taken there by archaeologists. And archaeology, of course, is all about memory. Absolutely. And, um, and um, I was invited to, to dig in the trenches at Knossos. They were discovering a new part of the Royal Road. And, you know, I didn't know then that when that palace was dug up, Freud, that was exactly the time when Freud was uncovering the unconscious. It's as if the, the you know, the heart of Europe the beginning of the Minoan palaces where Europa was taken, the, just the, the first big royal civilization of Europe. Um, that was also the royal, what, what, you know, it was dreams. It was what Freud called the royal road to the unconscious. It, it's completely extraordinary, that parallel. 
Absolutely. And, and his, you know, archaeology becomes the great metaphor for what psychoanalysis attempted to do, yes. to uncover. Yes, exactly. Um, so I lived in Crete and got to know the Cretans and Greek and so on, um, for, you know, for years and years and years off and on. But in the last 12 years, I got to know a completely different part of Crete, and which I really hadn't known about, um, partly through my friend Nicholas Delange, who's a rabbi in, who acts as a rabbi in the, um, the last Jewish monument in Crete, which is a synagogue. And I became, through him, I became very close to the man who rescued it and indeed rescued the whole history of the Cretan Jews from oblivion. You know, nobody talks about the Holocaust on Crete. You know, in Britain, we have Paddy Lee Fermer, we have all, we have Ill Met by Moonlight, we have the story of the Renaissance, of the resistance rather. And, um, um, but the, the Jews are forgotten. There is a, a Jewish poet, a Cretan Jewish poet called Josef Ventura, who has done a poem about what happened to them. But um, I think that's only been published in America and Greece. Um, so I wondered, did, um, did how I presented the Jewish life, which I got to know through the archives and through the, this wonderful man who rescued the synagogue. Did it, did it strike, come across truly to you? I thought it was wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a part of the world that I really know. And, and your evocation of it made it feel incredibly alive, which is, after all, what, you know, what one needs. And, and um, it was also a very, very haunting story because um, it seems to me with these small communities, when they appear and disappear, um, they can be completely wiped out with anybody, without anybody recollecting. Because, you know, I mean, I want you to tell this story, not me, but, uh, you know, the survivors are all just about gone uh, yeah. from that particular um, community. So tell us, I mean, you came across this book through this archaeological work and through the existence of the synagogue, but what made you want to write about it? The stories that this man, Nikos Stavroulakis, told me. He was a very charismatic man who really listened to people's stories. He loved, he was a fabulist really, but he also loved stories. He was a historian and an architectural historian. Um, and he sort of sat in a synagogue and the stories came to him. I mean, there was one night when um, somebody turned up, uh, she seemed to be American, but then she did speak Greek rather rustily and she said she wasn't, she wasn't Jewish, she'd never been in a synagogue before, but she'd lived in Chania before the war and her school friends had been taken by the Germans. And as they were going, she, they, one called up to her and said, will you keep my books for me? And so she had caught, kept the books for her and she wondered if Nikos knew where she was now so she could um, give them back. And Nikos was just, very quietly said, well, I'm afraid um, she didn't come back. And so she cried and she gave him a photograph, which is the only photograph of all the people, about 300 Jews who died on that ship. And um, um, it's two girls. They're about sort of 13 and 14. One of them has got a, a bandage on. She'd knocked, she explained that she'd knocked her wrist that day or something. And um, I found those two sisters as very moving. And then Nikos told me another story about a girl who was Jewish, but the night, you know, the, the, the Nazis came early in the morning, of course, as they always did. And um, the night before she was out, naughty girl, with her non-Jewish boyfriend, and that saved her life. And she came back you know, early in the morning, and they, all the people in the in the road said, "Quick, quick, get away! They've they're just collecting all the furniture. All your people have been taken." Yeah. So, so she, this is this is true. So he took her to the mountains and hid her there. But unfortunately, the boy died of pneumonia, and she came back to this. You know, four years later to this, or a few years later to this transformed town where nobody wanted to know. There was a whole issue about property that's never really been sorted out or clarified what happened to the very beautiful house, houses and who, who owned them and how, which are now, you know, the, the tourist center of the, of the town. Um, so I sort of amalgamated those two stories with the, the girl who escaped 
and the um, you know the the two sisters who, who did not, but we have their photograph. Read us a bit. Well, okay. So I didn't want to I didn't want to do it as a sort of historical novel, a, a straight historical novel, and I didn't want to appropriate and, and say this is my culture because I'm not Jewish, and I felt this, this was that would be wrong. So my character is was born in Crete. And as far as she knows, she's just not Jewish. She happened to marry an English Jew in London because she's an artist and worked in London. But now she's back and she's discovered that her mother has gone through all this and survived. Um, in the late afternoon, at the window of my room, I take in the familiar evening smells of burning souvlaki, cinnamon and petrol fumes. You can't deny your past, but what if you never knew it? I am Jewish, but I don't know how to be. Like the Indian girl in Amrita Shergill's painting, Two Girls, I am a self in shadow, dark to itself. I should explain that she went to art school here in London and um, she was very taken by um, Amrita Shergill, who also was a divided identity. She was Hungarian Jewish, but also had a Sikh father. So she painted some paintings in Europe and then went to India. And my character rather identifies with that. And she feels, um, she feels that you know, she, she belongs in two places, still with no idea that, that she was half Jewish. I am a self I do not understand. And yet here is the same old evening star coming out to greet me through leaves of the tree that guarded us as we grew, as if still communing with the child who slept and dreamed here, argued with her brothers and felt safe. Underneath the grinding sadness for my mother, I realize I am thinking of my Jewish identity, an identity I never knew I had, as lost treasure. Is there some ritual, some ceremony of possession that can call it back? I have lost other identities too, the selves I've grown like rings of bark and took for granted, the English painter with a Cretan soul, the Cretan who never thought about church but celebrates it Easter anyway. And now I'm the woman who married a Jew and took part in his family festivals, not knowing they should have been hers. I look at the mountains beyond, Cezanne, poured his loneliness into his own native landscape. He said there was sadness in it. When he paints divisions in the road or knots in a tree where branches divide, I see him searching for a pain that spoke to him. He said the real discoveries come from chaos, from going to the place that looks wrong. So, I mean, I could read a little more about going through the town, but, but perhaps I should, you know, I, I want to explore this because your memories of your parents' memories, that's what I was trying to chase here for her, but I had to imagine myself into it. Um, well, I think you've done it very well, and I, I'm not a great, um, I mean, I think all writers inevitably appropriate whatever it is that they're writing about, whether it's just a simple story of my going to the corner shop and imagining what the man is thinking or imagining myself into a different tradition. I mean, I think that's okay. Um, and I think you've done it beautifully. And um, it's a very absorbing and evocative book. So uh, no, no, you know, I, no problems with any of that. I've just put that in to the discussion. Um, I think another thing that, that sort of made me, convinced me, but you didn't actually uh, try to interpret, you just placed it there. Was, you mentioned in your reading, for example, that your heroine, we the artist, um, marries a Jewish man. Now, this could be complete happenstance, but as, as you know, a hundred years of, of um, living with uh, the unconscious has shown us, what we do unwittingly is, of course, not a complete accident. And, and so, I, you know, I think some of this, um, the things you put into the book in terms of structuring the characters also works into the sense of, of um, the way in which what is hidden within families 
is recreated un completely unconsciously, completely unwittingly uh, by the, the, you know, the subsequent generation. Um, I love that. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad because then she starts to realize that her mother's memories and trauma and repression have always had this impress on her. And there's always been something she, she doesn't, she didn't know and felt was wrong and felt was a shadow. And, um, you know, it took a long time to get that. I talked a lot with Ava Hoffman, um, you know, of, um, who's done, written so much and thought so much about all this. And also with Elaine Feinstein, who actually went to Crete and met this man who, who um, ran the synagogue and um, liked him very much. And she kept saying, Ruth, why were the Germans different? Why was it different in Crete? And actually there isn't really an answer. I asked Nikos that. And possibly because they had so much trouble with the Cretans. I mean, there were no yellow stars. And, um, you know, in Athens and Salonika, it was, it was terrible and wholesale. But on Crete for three years, they were just um, aggravated. They had to hand in their ritual knives and everything. And then eventually um, notices were put up on the uh, saying Jewish shop, German officers may not go in and things like that. But otherwise they were really left alone. I think it's probably because that you know uh, it's a very small community. It was a very small community, and also that the, the reason the Germans were there was more strategic than to do with extermination, which is um, you know uh, the primary intent in other places. Yes, uh, absolutely. So, so, um, it is different, uh, but 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 that is that in itself is is very interesting too. And I I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about it, which one, one of which is to do with the relationship between the father and the mother um, in the story. Uh, just tell us about it a bit and, and you know, why you chose to do this, this uh, insurrectionist and this woman who is um, you know, having to dampen down her own or lie about her own history. Well, they met, of course, when, when they were teenagers and he was a carpenter. And I know people like him in Crete very, very well. They were, they were, he was based on people whom I worked with at Knossos actually. And some of the stories come out of things that were told me then, you know, in the seventies, um, because memories were still fresh then. People would tell me stories about taking a donkey past the Germans and um, it was full of explosives and on the saddle and, and um, so on. And a friend of mine, father was actually killed in the way that my hero's um, grandfather was killed because he refused to give up his arms to the Germans so they shot him straight away. Um, um, so the, the relationship is one of complicated class in a way because the Jews were, it was a totally integrated society and um, they all went to the same school um, and the Jews were more educated than this boy who was, you know, a carpenter and stopped education at the age of 12 and has lived off the mountains and so on. Um, they could read, they could read Greek, they could read Hebrew um, and he has no money and they did have money. There was a lot of, a lot of the Jews were, were artisans, sort of silver workers, things like that. There were also, of course, teachers, lawyers. A lot of the rich Jews, got out they had radios and they knew what was happening else and they got out of Crete um, so in fact and we have you know the, the Germans were so um, list list conscious we have got the whole list of all the names of the people who died and what they were and there are house housekeepers there are pistachio sellers you know they're quite humble people um, so he he works for them and he hadn't actually been inside a synagogue until he did some carpentry work there. And there were two synagogues then. There was a wonderful old one, um, which was bombed in the, in the very heavy bombing um, before the German invasion. And then this little one, which still survives, which was a Venetian church. And he goes in and he understands that, you know, this is a very old Crete. It's a different Crete from his Crete. Uh, one of the things it goes right back to history that, for instance, for a while, the Turks, after, after they chased the Venetians out, the Turks ruled Crete. And although the Cretan mountains are full of a revolution against the, against the Turks, 
the, the Turks were actually quite good for the Jews because they took down the ghetto walls, which the Venetians had imposed, sort of Shylock style um, ghetto. And um, they allowed the Jews to own property again. So quite a lot of Jews came in. Um, and um, so, you know, this boy takes it all on board and likes the girl and she's very pretty. And um, they sort of get together. Okay, I don't want to spoil the plot in any way, but but there's one other question that arises from this, and, the, and this is to, really to do with the history of Crete itself and the uprising there or the resistance to Nazi rule, which in the way you describe it is actually very strong and, and important to the residents. Yes, it's it was huge. And of course, in Britain, because so much has been written by um, British officers, who were there, and also in Australia and New Zealand, because a lot of um, Australian Commonwealth um, soldiers were fighting with the British, which were, were on Crete, and then were left on Crete um, when the British evacuated Crete to Alexandria. And they got on very well with the Cretans. They understood the sort of life, the sort of rough life, sheep, goats, mountains, you know, running around. And um, they very, very close friendships were, were formed. And there are some really wonderful memoirs by um, Australians and New Zealanders. You can sometimes find them in, in bookshops in Crete. And, um, but the Cretans themselves were with a with whole history of rebelling against the Turks and a huge sort of bed of songs and remembrances. Um, they, they just swung into resistance mode straight away. And um, there, were, there were sort of clans in the mountains forming on the three, in the main three different sorts of parts of the mountains. And um, so there's a wonderful book that, that um, Paddy Lee Ferma um, edited called The Cretan Runner, which were the memoirs of somebody who ran between the different resistance groups. So I used that quite a lot. He, he, he wrote it out, he, he, he told it. So, so, so just in terms of our theme, th this is the part of memory that becomes history. This is, if you like, what's in the official records and what we know most about. And then another bit of the history is sort of forgotten until it resurfaces and, and people like you and uh, the people who now keep the museum in, in Crete yeah. Yeah. Um, make it public once more. And I'm, I'm very interested in that because it seems to me that this, um, both on a, on a public and historical level um, um, and on an individual level is the way in which memory and the bits that we forefront and, and choose to select works too. I mean, so individually and socially, this happens to our species and our times. Um, and depending on what we select out, is this is the kind of beings we actually aspire to be and what we, we want. And I, I, was, I was very interested in, in, because I don't know anything about this particular moment of history, either, either the Cretan insurrection or, or indeed the, you know, the Jewish community there. I, I was very interested as to, uh, I don't know, why it was you had been drawn to um, making the mother a keeper of a secret which is so strong that it never comes out at all to the children. I mean, what is it about her? What is it about her story that necessitates that? Because of course my parents and indeed all her friend, all their friends did talk about the war and um, it was equally hideous and perhaps more so because there were also camps. Um, uh, and yet they did speak about it, certainly at first, they then didn't for a long time, but, but until they were dying. <laughs> but, did but they have friends? While I was small, they did. But it was, it was, that was in a context of, I suppose, of, of other people who knew about the Holocaust. And, and, and whereas this was a very cut off community, they were quite um, poor people and not very educated. And the, there is, I'm afraid, an awful lot of anti-Semitism in, in Greece, in Crete. I mean, one of the things I've heard people say is the Jews killed Christ. It's just there in the, the, the um, you know, the sea of thought. And, um, and so they wanted to keep it 
quiet. And also in my story, of course, there's another character whom perhaps we won't get into, a, a lost character, whom the mother really, really doesn't want to talk about but because she feels so ambivalent about her. And this is the sort of final secret. And that's partly why I called it a labyrinth in a way, because, I, you know, the labyrinth had the minotaur at the centre. Yeah. Um, but at the centre of this is something which is emotionally, in a way, a minotaur to the mother. But actually, it's a sort of a lost little figure. And um, my character realises that the mother is projecting her own feelings, her ambivalence and guilt and all sorts of things onto her and always has. And it's that realisation, actually, which lets them move on. Well, so I find that fascinating. I mean, I, and I found your revelations towards the end of the book, which I won't go into. I don't want to have a spoiler. <laughs> um, um, a, a very um, crucial somehow to understanding the patterns of the characters, because I do think a lot of the um, discourse around secrecy and war, secrecy and shame, uh, how closely they're allied, is not only to do with public history, but very much to do with family history and and how that pans out and and you know where's people where people's emotions go um, in yes. in these times and through the course of their lives. Um, um, so I mean, in losing the dead, it's one of the things that I chart and and um, the patterns that emerge from what is unspoken are as great as the patterns that emerge from what is spoken. I think in the child's lives. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and, and, and mothers and daughters and, and um, because this is also a book about mothers and daughters as it, mine, as Losing the Dead is, as indeed are all my books inevitably. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you I, wrote a sequence of poems about your mother dying and yeah. obviously she was crucial to you as well. And that was just before you completed this book or Went yes, back to working I, on I did book. the book in several layers, and I suppose the layers of memory, the archaeological layers, are again, at first I just wrote the story of the teenagers who escaped and went through the war and the loss and the discovery about what had happened to all the, all the Jews and indeed her family. Um, but then I put the extra layer of the, of the daughter on her, on, on, and then finally, I put I put an extra layer. The daughter has a daughter. So I was very interested. I did read quite, uh, Jacqueline Rose and all sorts of people about um, not just inherited trauma in the second generation, but in the third generation, what that does, how you don't really know what it is that you're, you've inherited, this shadow or this complexity. Yes. I, d I don't like to use the word trauma too much in relation to this, although, you know, in many cases it is technically if you like trauma I mean the kind of thing that you cannot speak about it's just something that appears and shapes you um, but but because I think that in all families of whatever kind one has this play of what is revealed and what is kept hidden uh, whether unwittingly or wittingly yes. I mean I, I think I think you know it happens in good English uh, never left the country families as much as it does in people who've come from war-torn regions or uh, migrants who've come through terrible histories of immigration and so on. So, so I, th I think one has to, you know, show some of the similarities as well as the, um, and I, so I don't like the word trauma particularly. I think there is transgenerational haunting. I think, you know, there's a way in which the ghosts in families play out in the way in which one behaves in family situations. I mean, for example, we were talking about filling out forms for COVID and, and the horrors of travel these days, in part because of the fear of, of the disease, but also because of the extra layer of bureaucracy. And one of the things I remember from my childhood, and I never understood the reasons why, is that my father in particular was, was terrified of crossing borders and of filling out forms. Um, and as a child, of course, you can't put together, um, you know, the bureaucracy of one period of wartime and the bureaucracy that 
because you don't know what bureaucracy is. You don't know about these levels of statecraft that interfere and impinge on individual lives inevitably in whatever context. Um, and so I still have this nervousness about form filling because it seems to me a, a kind of disciplinarian <laughs> level of, of, of the state that I don't know how to cope with. And I'm sure that's part of what my parents gave to me because I was imitating their own anxieties without knowing what they were about. Yeah. I mean, the, in, in, this, in this book, she suddenly realizes when her, her mother actually knew that her family was dead. And she realizes there's a big difference between her older brother, um, who was born and grew up, you know, until about three or four, um, when she still thought the family would come back. And then herself and her younger brother, who um, are full of doubt and um, always have to sort of check things and never take anything for granted. And they were born after she realized that all this time she thought they were going to come back and they'd all they'd been under the sea. Um, so um, I, I, I had to imagine myself all into that. And I think I couldn't have done it if I hadn't. My mother died during while I was writing the book and the book took 10 years and um, my mother died in 2017 and the book of poems I wrote after that called Emerald is I, I was I was really I thought I was going to write a, a book of poems about emeralds and the symbolism and green and all sorts of things and then she completely hijacked the book by dying um, and the book turned into an elegy for her but I went into her memories and tried to remember what her what her life was like and yes. and so <clears throat> I love that sequence. Mm. I read a little. Place. Shall I read a little bit from um, when she's she gets back at the end of of the to, to when she's discovered most of of the revelations. Okay. She and starts. Don't read spoilers because I think it's a book that you know one wants yeah. to be able to pursue with mystery. <laughs> yeah. But she's she's um she's going to. Um, she wants to paint again and one of her brothers runs a hotel and she says she'll paint for him this a, a landscape for him um, because I I've always in my poetry I've always used painting as a kind of um, correlative if you like for for um, you know for, for poetry for explore how you exp how an artist explores their material and so she's starting again but she's realizing she's got to paint from a different self now She's a different person. When I start a new work, I have to feel open and unknowing. So what the painting needs will come to me freely. Picasso said it was like jumping off into space. For me, it's like being a door. You wait and hope something will enter. The canvas floats in front of me, daunting but familiar, familiar a pure, clean beginning again. I don't usually draw on canvas. Sometimes I draw with a thin brush and terp solution, but I haven't touched a brush since my friend Nashita said that word withheld. Right at the beginning of the book, she's got a show of paintings about Crete and her friend says, well, they're lovely, but there's something withheld. And she doesn't know what that is. Not since I've discovered I'm a different person from the one I knew to be and that our lives have been lived over a black hole not since I've learned what this sparkling sea conceals. Now I have to find the central space from which everything will radiate, a space to trust, an area of stillness that lets me realize the rest where I can, well, the way I put it to myself is where I can tell the truth. So she's trying to work out what she feels about all this um in terms of of where she really is now which is painting which is her art which for me is writing and for you is writing um you know we we know where we are when we're we're trying to put something into words or in her case into into paint um so i love I, that i love that and i love the way you you uh, allowed her to come to a greater understanding of what was going on inside her through the actual expression in her work, which is of course the way we work as writers or painters or indeed musicians. Um, it occur occurs to me that, you know, in order to, to uh, sort of think 
or to round off what we've been saying about uh, memory and forgetting and loss, perhaps. Um, I might read a little from Everyday Madness, which was my book about mourning, of course, and about yes. John and um, uh, the mourning that went into, I think, the, the grief and the rage, which compromises, which, which makes up mourning, which comprises mourning, that went into Brexit um, and that atmosphere, which is part of uh, Everyday Madness. So can I just read this and then we can, we can do the... Um, Finale. Um, and this is again about, this section is about childhood because the last section of the book was about what the grandchildren, my grandchildren, made me recognize about my own childhood and my own ways of, of constructing memory. Memory is meant to be the faculty by which our identity is constituted. Mine has always felt slippery which is perhaps why I ended, ended up spending years researching it from lab to literature. It's clear that recollection is prompted and also colored by whatever it is that sets it off. Much disappears and is re-edited according to what present emotions need or need to annihilate about the past. The title of my first novel, Memory and Desire, was sparked not only by the extraordinary opening of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, but by what the analyst Wilfred Bion noted, memory is the past tense of desire. I love that. Childhood is largely an atmosphere in which some key events figure large. It can take on more moment when we're involved with our own children or grandchildren. My own early life is largely unremembered terrain. My parents back then were the kinds of immigrants who focused far more emph emphatically on the future than on the past. Anticipation is a mood I recognize far more readily than nostalgia. And nostalgia, of course, is one of the key elements in creating our current political narrative. So I, I won't go on about that, but I just wanted to put in the forgetting side as, as important in this structuring of memory, which is what, yeah. of course, you do in your book as well. Yes, at one point we says we remember something as what we have lost makes us who we are. <clears throat> and we might sort of ease into that now because we are we are facing eras of instability. You know, you you and I have grown up through a through a time a society believing that everything is just going to get better and stronger and safer and brighter and rosier. And now we're seeing how labile it all is and how and, and COVID just whipped the rug from under us. But Brexit has whipped, whipped the rug from under us too. And so I, I suppose um, my, my character is, is, is thinking of that because she's now, you know, she doesn't know what's going to happen to her having a Greek passport after, after Brexit in England. And um, she's also sort of remembering how the Minoans, you know, the Minoan palaces were covered up by, drowned by a tsunami and earthquakes and stuff. So how do we, how does culture help us cope with this fragility on which we stand? And how can we be connected through literature by, you know, to people who, who knew how to ride those waves? Well, I think we're in, in, the case of those of us who read and, and there are, according to the publishers, increasing numbers of us, we're constantly being connected by literature. I mean, I think, um, uh, you know, just, I, I think I stayed alive through COVID, not only by listening to academics thinking and trying to create this publishing, um, this digital publishing, which we called expeditions, because they were expeditions, particularly during lockdown into other worlds, other worlds of thought, but, but writers, I mean, you know, I spent most of the COVID lockdown reading books from elsewhere because I so needed to be elsewhere. So I read Russian literature and I read Spanish and I read Italian um, because I wanted to be in those other places and other minds. And, and I think that's, that's constantly what we do. I also reread a great deal. And that's that travel into the past, I think, is also a way of structuring our present and allowing us to hold out hope for the future. Because if we didn't have a past, we wouldn't think of a future at all. We'd just be caught in imminence, uh, yeah. which is often yeah. what religion does, of course. I mean, you know. Um, so what, what about you, Ruth? Well, having lived in Greece for so long, I mean, I, I Greece is my touchstone. And quite literally, there's a wonderful poem by George Seferis called The King of Assini, in which they go, they're exploring an old Bronze Age citadel. 
but um, it's you know it's not a posh one. It's not one of the ones in the in, in the guidebooks or anything. And he, and it was just a name. He says it's just a name in Homer. The one half name, Asine, Asine. And he says all morning we've we've searched around the citadel, and finally here. And he sort of there's this image of touching the rock. We have touched. Maybe we have touched his fingers on the stones. And I think oh, of that, oh, it's wonderful. And I think of that as, you know, because I grew up, you know, I did classics and, you know, Sappho's words, Sappho's sort of tiny fragmentary words on these scraps of papyrus connect us to people. You know, the, 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 um, the stars sink, the watch goes by, the moon has set, but I lie alone. You know, just those four little fragmentary lines of a few Greek words scratched on a papyrus. And there is the whole of lyrics there and the whole of all the feelings of pop music and, and arias and God knows what of our lyric individual loneliness in just one person's scrapped yes. on a bit of paper. And one has this enormous sense of continuity through time because we can actually read that and make sense of it and and okay. and, and somehow relate to the emotion in it. And I think that's what language and literature and poetry do yeah. better than anything else. And and writing and writing. I mean one okay. of the one of the books I really loved which I was reading for my book and I think we should probably sign off but it was, a, was written by a child he was a schoolboy in a little suburban bit of Crete and the, it's just called it's, it's published in, in Crete it's called the leaden sky years because the lead was always coming down from the sky because of the bombings of the Germans and so on and um, it's a it's he was a sort of obviously a bright boy who was just writing his diary about what was happening them, to them day by day. And that sort of the, the belief, the trust in writing and that somebody else will read it is the, is one of, for me, is one of the most prime relationships. I can second that very, very happily. <laughs> well, thank you, Ruth. Yeah, thank it's been you. such a pleasure. Um, yeah. Onward we go. <laughs> On we go. More literature. More, More books. literature. <laughs>